Um, sorry about that. It was a little weird break. Wait, mic's back on. Cool. Um, little technical difficulties. But you know what? Sometimes a moment of silence is really what you need. Just, you know, that background noise all the time. So, <laughs> so Greg, welcome yes. back. You well, haven't been on in several much, months. Georgia. It, it has been several months. And there was a reason for that. Yes. That I haven't been on for several months. Yeah. Talk about it. Well, it's because I wanted to get my book out, and uh, I figured if I didn't just focus on that, I would never get it done. So um, it was uh, released March 20th on Amazon.com. It's an ebook. It's a novel. It's called A Western Capitol Hill. And, Ronell, when you get a chance, maybe a little later, it, it, I've got the cover on the computer there. You could just bring it up to show the folks. Um, should be right in the center of the screen. Um, on the desktop. Yep. Yeah. Oh, we got to take lot. everything that's down. Right. But go ahead. What is it called? It's called A Western Capitol Hill, and that's what it should say on there by Gregory Dower. So um, yeah. So before we start talking about, about yes. the, the content of the book, how and why did you start writing this book? Well, I wrote this book because I um, decided it was time to write a novel in my life, and I assisted a good friend with editing his book, and uh, I took inspiration from that and saw how he did it, how he put things together, and decided that I was going to do it myself. Um, my sixth grade teacher told me I was going to be a writer, <laughs> and uh, I've always wanted to be a writer. Um, I think at that time in sixth grade, I wanted to be a rock star, but... Um, <laughs> She said, no, you're going to be a writer. But I've, I've been a singer-songwriter as well, so I've mixed that together. Sure. I do uh, uh, my singer-songwriter under the name Gregory Ego, and I'm also doing some kind of electronic music stuff with a friend. It's called Reverend Lead Pipe and his pipe-wielding swingers. So there's those two projects. They're on Bandcamp if uh, you want to click back and listen to the names of them again and then uh, – Research that on Bandcamp. You can certainly find it. Can I pause you right quick? Yes, go right ahead. Reverend Lead Pipe. Absolutely. <laughs> that's that's amazing, yo. I, w I could have never thought of that. Like, I, there's no way I would have ever came up with Reverend Lead Pipe. I could have had a lead pipe in my mm -hmm. hand at church, <laughs> and I still wouldn't have managed to pull right. that one off. Is that's that up? Good. Is that up on the screen? Is that up on the? Did you put it in the window? You put it in a window. It kind of has a blue then, sound to me. Like, and then that goes over us. Like Reverend Gary Davis or uh, like or Lead Belly. Um, so, uh, but it, but it's but it's not quite the blues. It's not quite uh, two feet in the blues. You know what we can do? The other thing we can do, if it's if that's hard, is we can. I've got it pulled up on my phone. I got it. I got you got it. it? Okay. All right. There we go. Well, that's the cover. There we are. Yep. Perfect. A Western Capitol Hill by Gregory Dower. So Capitol Hill. Yes. In, in well, lots of. Of cities is a neighborhood. It's a there, neighborhood. There are a few cities that have Capitol Hills, but yes, this is set in Denver. This is set in Denver in the neighborhood of Capitol Hill, and it's set at the Capitol itself. And it involves a bill at the state Capitol introduced by a religious right legislator from Colorado Springs. And it's a controversial bill, so it's opposed by a transgender real estate broker on Capitol Hill. And both of them uh, in their circles have a, a lobbyist that they hire, so there's a couple lobbyists working against each other as well. Now, That's furthermore, there's some magical realism-type elements. There's a dragon called the Denver Dragon, hence the, uh, the, the dragon on the cover of the book. This Denver, this Denver dragon was birthed during the first gold strike in Denver, and it kind of took on massive proportions over the years as Denver accumulated greed and poisonous industries. And, uh, nice. And... Uh, the, the not nice elements of a city. Yeah. Is there historical? Is the like? Is there historical truths Truth. in it? That's like like a like a what book would I think of the um, this dragon slayer or the uh, vampire slayer of um, Abe Lincoln? You know how like it had like the historical truths in it that it was fictional. Do you carry some of those historical truths from the Colorado history? There are some historical truths. I have a uh, beginning of the book called the train intro because the trains play a, a, a big part 
in this story. It's kind of like a Greek chorus. They signify what's been stated at the end of chapters. And of course, the trains are an integral part of Denver's history. If it really hadn't been for trains, Denver wouldn't have reached uh, the size that it had. I'll uh, be reading like one or two little pieces, but yeah. since you brought, brought that up, let me just find the section train Go intro. The camera, thanks. Perfect. I'll just read a couple parts of this because I don't want to read the whole thing. The homesteaders who moved to Denver in the late 19th century heard the trains too. So did the coots and hustlers as they boiled their coffee broth on the stove each yonder morn. Train will soon be unloading a new crop of sporting women and fresh marks, they enthused. So did the prairie dogs with ears perked standing up on their rodent hind legs beside their burrowed holes, making themselves easy headshot targets for rifles gripped in expansionist hands. Denver prospered because of trains. Really, why else would the migration have continued to this scenic, yet in many regards, inhospitable locale after the initial gold strike petered out? The Mile High City made its mark as a mercantile hub due to railway transit, not because it was on any negotiable river or coastal waterway. Within 20 years of the first train arriving in 1870, Denver's population increased from under 5,000 people to over 100,000. Wow. Denver was, for its era, a metropolitan freak of nature, a fluke of the Industrial Revolution, a dusty port on the high plains at the ass end of the short grass prairie land. Nice. So that's a little bit of uh, the historical record injected into my tale. And it's literally repeating itself with the, the airport. Absolutely. The airport plays into the story as well. It's, uh, I mean, like, just as, I mean, I love Colorado. It's one of my favorite places. I've been here my whole life. Um, that I mean, how you say it, if if how, how you use the historical accuracy, it's repeating itself over again right. where our population literally has doubled in almost 20, 30% in four years due to I have a character airport. that points that out as he's driving on his way to the airport, you know, past uh, – the Carniceria on Brighton Boulevard and and the uh, VW repair shop and thinking about, you know, how much Denver's changed. Of course, that whole area has changed since this book. This book is set about 2007. But, uh, yeah, he gets out to the airport and talks again about how many people have uh, come into the state uh, due to the airport. And talk about some of the weird stuff at the airport, you know, some of the legends and rumors yes, yeah. and mythology about it, the weird art, the Masonic cornerstone that has a weird airport agency's name on it, uh, the legends about uh, underground uh, trains that, you know, who knows, maybe they go all the way to the military industrial complex in Colorado Springs where this guy came up from Interesting. in his car. So do you have another do you have another piece you want to read? I do since this yeah. is i cannabis radio and this is set in Denver mid 2000s let's say um, what would it be how can you have a Denver tale and not include marijuana? You can't. So not anymore. Mm. Hmm. I've created a governor these are not really based on real people. I've taken aspects of different people and uh made new characters out of them. So this is not an actual governor, but his name is uh, Governor Emil Gutierrez. And it says, Gutierrez has the reputation of being a governor who understands farmers. For instance, he understands the needs of corn growers. They want to see everything from high, fru fru high fructose corn syrup to building materials to automobile fuel made out of corn. Ask him, though, what plant he'd defoliate out of existence with Agent Orange, and he'll quickly reply, marijuana, reefer, mota, as it's referred to in the south of the border parlance of some of his vagabond uncles. It incenses Gutierrez when a crowd of 1,200 gathers outside the Capitol, smoking pot openly as they listen to bands and speakers. 
They're mostly underage kids, too, and no arrests are made. No Denver police, at least in uniform, are even in sight. If the police had been there as a visible presence, they'd have to arrest someone, right? Well, you'd think so. Denver voters may have legalized marijuana possession at the ballot box, but police still write tickets under the state law. Obviously, the beat cops have been ordered to stay away from the, quote, hemp rally, unquote. A tall, bulky guy with a bushy beard and thinning hair screams into a microphone on the Capitol steps. His voice thunders from a huge public address system, echoing all the way downtown. Governor Gutierrez, he yells, assaulting the mic with his lungs, spittle flying. Take back your unfreedom-like stance against the hemp plant. Laws against cannabis were first passed back in the 1930s due to racism against Mexicans. One newspaper editor in Southern Colorado even wrote the following, I wish I could show you what a small marijuana cigarette can do to one of our degenerate Spanish-speaking residents. That's why our problem is so great. The greatest percentage of our population is composed of Spanish-speaking persons, most of whom are low mentally because of social and racial conditions. As a Mexican-American, Governor Gutierrez, you ought to be ashamed of yourself to still be enforcing laws against marijuana. Boo! Howls a segment of the crowd, which is apropos since boo was also at one time a slang term for marijuana. Following the speaker, a creepy amalgamation of musicians begins a death metal version of Black Sabbath's song, Sweet Leaf. Among the throngs of underage tokers wanders Philip Philly Gutierrez, the governor's 14-year-old son. A black ski mask with holes for the eyes and mouth obscures most of his face. He raises it up to his forehead, though, in order to puff on a spliff the size of a submarine sandwich that's being hoisted and passed around the crowd. A hidden video camera records the moment. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. So you can see what that's going to uh -oh. lead to, some conflict. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, so, so you came up with this idea. You yeah. had a desire to... to Write a novel. That's correct. Felt like it was a it was a calling for you. Absolutely. How did you come up with the story? Well, that's a good question. I wanted to write about Denver. I wanted to make Denver almost like a character that you would see in a novel, just like any other character. The city had to be a character. And years and years ago, early '90s, I was uh, working for a music magazine out here, and there was a a gentleman who worked there as well, and uh, he was on some psych meds, and uh, he had perhaps some issues, and he told me that there's a dragon that hovers above Denver, and it was built on all the greed and avarice and lust and, and terrifying things the city had accumulated. And that always stuck with me. So that became so one of my first So did you buy like characters. something that he was doing? He was like, wait a minute, give me some, and saw the dragon too and was like, gotta write about it. I got it. I saw, I know what you're talking about. I didn't want anything of what he was taking. Okay. Okay. I think it sounds like pharmaceuticals. Absolutely. Yeah. That, that's what it was. It was some yeah. psych meds yeah. is what I'm implying. Yeah. So um, so I came up with that character and the other characters just came out of that and Neat. put them together, set them in motion. Stephen King has said, you just come up with some characters, set them in motion, and they almost dictate where you're going to go. Um, wow. I, I, I realized that was the case for me, at least, yeah. when I wrote this tale because they just took me places I didn't expect. And most of my characters at the very end disappoint me. Huh. So that's how I knew they had a life of their own. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't directing them to disappoint me or maybe my expectation is disappointment, but wow. <laughs> I had a good time that they disappointed me. Greg, you have to set higher expectations for your characters. <laughs> Jeez. Oh, well, you know, I love my <laughs> characters. <laughs> well, I know. I mean, like, I guess where when if they're disappointed by you, I guess that means you're still building on them and you still probably got 
a sequel. In I don't mean I'm behind. disappointed in, in in them. I mean they do actions uh-huh. that I were like, oh gosh, really? You went ahead and did that? Oh, oh so I like your children? Her. So like yeah, your exactly. children? You're like, I like my you children. Just, oh man, you just spilt it. We just talked about this. We just totally exactly. talked about. It. You know how I know? Mother's Day because I just created you and we talked about. That. I know. I say that. Is, that's a line that I say all the time. We just had a conversation about this. Oh, that's the, I mean, I guess being a parent, I think that's the biggest thing. Like, they they do something, you talk about it, they do it again to make sure what you said is right. a fact, and then we don't deal with this for a while. Right. It might come back up, you know. You know how, like, they like to recycle problems. That's right. That's right. All right, do you have another another excerpt for us, or are you done with the excerpts? Well, I could read another excerpt. That'd be, that'd be sure. awesome. Sure, let's see what we got here. Should we skip this next break? We can. I mean, do you have it? Do you think it'll work or no? Keep going. Okay. Well, I'll find another part that um, well, deals somewhat. Well, go ahead. While you're doing that, um, yeah. so so people can download it on Amazon.com. That's right. A Western Capitol Hill. It's it's four dollars and some change. Yeah, it's four ninety nine. Yep. Yep. And I encourage people to do just that because it's an entertaining tale. It's got some darkness to it. It's darkly comedic, but it's funny. I mean, I laugh like hell writing it. So, so for young writers yes. or people who are trying to get in or get published, yes. um, what process did you uh, take and what notes can you give somebody who's writing a book and would like to get it uh, out to the world? Um, what notes and uh, tips would you give somebody into getting their stuff out or getting – um, published and making a couple of pennies off their work? Well, let's see. I would encourage people to write. That's the first thing. You've got to train yourself to write. And when I was in high school, I did free writing because of a great high school teacher I had. Um, then in college, I did freelance journalism, and it's something I've been doing since around 19. 19- 88 or so. So I've written articles. I've interviewed people who influenced me. So I've spoken with writers about what they do. Uh, That's a great thing to do is to talk to somebody else who's a writer, have kind of a mentorship. These were people I admired from a distance. So it was just great to uh, talk to them face to face. And one of them, at least, has given me feedback recently, well, a few years ago when I was just putting this, some of the final touches on this. Stick with it. This book, I wrote it from between like 2004 and 2007. And I've revised it and revised it and revised it since. And then I sent it off to agents and agents and agents and publishing companies. And I got rejected and rejected and rejected. But you have to keep going through the rejection. And luckily today, if you're that motivated, you can do it yourself. DIY approach and publish it on something like Amazon.com. Doesn't mean you can't uh, do it without having a great cover artwork like my friend Larry Hubble did for this novel. Uh, You can't do it without really good editing. You have to have somebody edit it other than just yourself, although you'll be doing that as well yourself. Uh, But the world's open in order to do something like that. What about – so after you – now you got the book. You got it. You can sell it. Um, What about promotions? Where do you build and what would you do to push kind of your boat into the ocean to kind of get – um, a good variety of, uh, of folks. Well, I'm still book. working on that, but one of the things I would suggest is come on iCannabis Radio. If, <laughs> if there's anything about cannabis in your book at all, like mine, it's not the central focus of my book. But no, I'm trying to get uh, reach out to as many press outlets as I can. I know people in the media. Um, So I'm working that right now, and I'm taking the steps that you need to online. I've got my own website, a westerncapitalhill.com. I'm setting up my, at at this point, uh, my pages, their author pages on a couple big sites like Amazon, as well as Goodreads. So it'll have some background about me, a lot of people who love writing, um, stumble across things or a friend will turn them on to a writer. So I'm hoping that that's will will happen as well. My friends will say, this is somebody you have to read. Um, and then um, a couple more questions. Is there a possibility to get it, get the hard cover? I mean, the hard copy? Not yet. Okay. Because I'm just doing it uh, as an ebook. Okay. 
because uh, there were expenses involved, involved in yeah. this. Uh, understandable. So I mean, right now with the cover and editing and uh, um, sending it off to be formatted, I. You know, I've accrued a little bit of debt, nothing terrible, but because uh, I, I love to get this out there. Yeah. But I know that eventually this will be in paperback form, if not hardcover. Say, you're talking to a stoner, you know, like yeah. for me, I, 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 I could roll a joint. At least like, by 2020. <laughs> Imagine Denver 2020. That's what the city's <laughs> promoting in terms of the arts. So nice. by 2020. And do you have a website that we can... A westerncapitalhill.com. Okay. Yep. Sweet. Great. All right. At the end of our show, do you want to read your last... Uh... Okay. I'll try to go yeah. through this fairly quickly. You don't have to rush. Winston. This is the character who sees the dragon, and he's on psych meds and occasionally medical marijuana to control some of his um, illusions, delusions. Winston's caseworker examines the dusty hovel. Winston, I'm saying this as a friend, not as your caseworker. Why don't you get out of this dingy apartment? It's dirty, moldy. It's holding you back socially. You need to reach out. Spend more time with people. How long have you been here? Fifteen years. The social worker wouldn't mind a refill of coffee, but Winston isn't budging from his chair. The social worker sets his cups down on his plate with a clink and says, Change is sorely needed, my friend. Winston wears a pained expression. This is just about the cheapest place out there. There isn't anything lower than five fifty a month for a one-bedroom place. I'm making it here, and when I'm not making it, the owner and I usually work something out. Winston turns his head away, looking out the window, not inviting further discussion on the topic. On a couple of occasions, when his dire circumstances coincide, coincided with the fall harvest, Winston trimmed marijuana buds for a few dollars. It helped him to pay his rent, and it allowed him to buy Christmas, Christmas presents for his sister and her kids. The marijuana would arrive in garbage bags from a cornfield. Gail interlock and paid a farmer to look the other way while her people grew a half acre. She sold nine-tenths of the load, donating the remaining 10% to a local medical marijuana co-op, a homey little space with a couple dozen different varieties of weed, hash, baked cannabis products, and tinctures. It's where Winston buys a gram or two when he can afford it. The sign on the door says, no shoes, no sutures, no service. After Gail delivered the cash to the farmer and a couple of King, Sh King Shoppers paper grocery bags, he smiled expansively. He still suspected that transsexualism might be something akin to devil worship, yet he'd grown fond of Gail. You know, Gail, I hate to sin, but I love you to pieces. You're my favorite tenant farmer. Are we going to do this again next year, Gail asked Farmer Cornell. Why don't you just buy my property so I don't have to be involved anymore? Well, why would you want to sell? Farmer Cornell sighs and massages his huge arthritic hands. Son's not going to take over. Can't make it as a farmer anymore, as a small timer. Big agribusiness runs the show these days. What would you want for it? A cool million. Well, that's going to take more capital than I can amass at present. How about one more harvest and then we'll talk again? The following October, they set about negotiating a price. I don't know, says Gail, shaking her head dubiously. A million seems a little too much. Besides, your spread's on the east side of the highway. People want to feel like they're closer to the mountains. There's less of a resale value on property over here. Farmer Cornell looks like he's on the verge of tears. Never thought someone would want to turn my family farm into a planned community. I was hoping you'd just grow keep growing pot on it. <laughs> New sheriff, less amenable to bribes. Besides, turning the back 40 into, mm, let's call it Dell Spring Acres, would be much more profitable. Gail knows from studying a satellite photo that Colorado's front range has been filling up with housing developments like acne on a zit-prone teenager's face. For his part, Winston remembers the small basement with a large gray table under an exposed light bulb, windows taped over, claustrophobic. On the table rested a mound of marijuana in its raw state, still on the stalk, cured haphazardly. Each member of the crew took sections of the plant and began to manicure it. They cut the buds off the stalk, trimmed the excess leaves that covered the tightly compacted, resin-packed flowers oozing THC and a myriad of other heady chemicals. They formed piles of finished product. 
something that had been transformed from looking like a long hair or a gun-toting redneck, for that matter, into a dangerously muscular buzz-cut marine. Strong stuff. Periodically, they stopped to clean the sticky resin off their scissors, saving those high-potency scrapings to smoke later. One of the crew put a handful of marijuana trimmings into a bottle of grain alcohol, making a tincture out of it. The Green Dragon, he called it. He liked to drip a bit into a water-filled shot glass and tr drink it before going to bed for pleasant dreams and a good night's rest. So, That's awesome. There you go. Greg, thank you so much. That's wonderful. Well, thank you for having me on the show. A Western Capitol Hill. A Western Capitol Hill. It's out now. On Amazon.com, Gregory Dower. Check him out on uh, westerncapitolhill.com as well. I want to thank Anthony from Ants Organic as well. Um, it's been big fun. Thank you guys so much, and we'll be back next week. Very good.